long nodule. Um, so I did a PET CT scan on him. I mean, he the surgeon actually ordered a PET CT scan on him. So when he came to see me, he uh, did not know the results of the PET and I did not know the results of the PET either. The PET scan actually showed um, he had disease in his he had that one nodule in his lung. He also had disease in his liver, his pancreas, his muscles, his esophagus. And then we could actually see his brain mets on PET scan, which as you know, is uncommon. The, basically it has to be so bad that you can actually see it on PET. That's not a good thing um, to be able to see a brain met on PET, obviously. So he freaked out. He was administrator of a St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which is a large hospital here in the US for children. Um, and so I gave him a dose of nivolumab while I was waiting on getting a liver biopsy uh, to get more information. So I gave him a dose of nivolumab. This is all in context of talking about metastatic melanoma, obviously. Um, gave him a dose of nivolumab. He went for his liver biopsy on day six after having received it. And the liver biopsy actually only showed lymphocytes. It no longer showed any malignancy, um, which is really quite impressive. On ultrasound, the lesion actually looked bigger in his liver, but really by day six, there was nothing left of the melanoma. He then went for brain surgery on day eight because he had a three centimeter brain met. Um, and when they did the craniotomy, there was nothing but... Um, lymphocytes in the cavity where the three centimeter brain met was. There was actually no viable tumor by day eight. He is now two and a half years later um, and all that his scans show is uh, scarring from previous disease. He has had no active disease and he's had not a single side effect to date. So, and he's doing absolutely fantastic. So as everyone who's treated melanoma knows, you don't get those kind of results with DTIC. Um, you don't get those results with chemotherapy. So really metastatic melanoma has dramatically changed from the point where it used to be horrible outcomes to now in the era of immunotherapy, a chance of completely wiping out the tumor, um, even in the CNS. Actually in uh, Randy's point of view, who's that gentleman's name with a single dose of therapy. So where's the data? So approved agents for uh, metastatic melanoma. I like this slide because it kind of goes through history. Um, before 2011, really all we had was DTIC, right? Dacarbazine. And less than a quarter people lived uh, for uh, more than a year. Um, and there was really no drugs that were even approved. The ones that were approved that we used DTIC was based on trashy phase two studies or single institution studies, but nothing with any real data. Um, then over the next 10 years, 12 drugs have been approved for the treatment of metastatic melanoma, completely reshaping the way that we think about the disease. So instead of being nihilistic and believing that um, everyone is going to die in a rapid period of time. We actually have an arsenal of a dozen drugs that we can uh, attack the melanoma with, depending on the molecular profiling of the drug, I mean, of the disease. Um, this is just a slide for your reference. Um, I'm gonna go through all the data behind it, but this is just a, I think a convenient slide to have, and obviously I will share it with you. Um, but what it does is it gives you the dosing and scheduling of all of the current approved drugs in melanoma. Uh, that way on a single slide, you get a good reference for everything, all, all drugs and dosing that you would need to know. So going through the data. So uh, things that we used to use for metastatic melanoma, we would use DTIC Abraxane, which is just a very expensive version of Taxol. So it's a nanoparticle bound Taxol to decrease uh, chair time and infusion reactions and interferon. These drugs were largely useless. Despite that, we actually studied them and used them. This is a randomized phase three trial from 2015, looking at uh, Abraxane or Nabpacaltaxel versus Dacarbazine. Um, what you'll note from this study uh, is that they randomized 500 people. On the overall response rate uh, was 
under 20%. So 10, uh, what, 11 to 15% of people responded to therapy. Um, the best response was partial responses. People did not get complete responses and progression-free survival was under six months. So again, looking right here, when you use decarbazine and metastatic melanoma, you expect a progression-free survival of 2.5 months versus nab paclitaxel 4.8 months. Both of those are really kind of inspire nihilism to anyone other than an oncologist, because basically saying you're giving these drugs, which all have side effects, um, you're shrinking the tumor in 15% of people at most, and the shrinkage is lasting under six months. Progression-free uh, survival, I'm sorry, overall survival is a year or less using uh, chemotherapy. Um, this is looking at the Kaplan-Meier curve uh, with progression-free survival, again, showing that with nab paclitaxel and DTIC, um, progression-free survival is very short and everyone eventually progresses. Um, this is not, these are not true tales on this curve. These all go to ground in the end if you follow people for long enough. The people here are just being censored because when the study was reported, um, they were still alive. That does not mean that they went on to live past that. And you can see that reflected by the number at risk at the bottom where it dwindles down to just one. So there's still one person alive at this time point, the last time point uh, out of the, what? 264. So that's not a real tail on the curve. Um, for progression, and then this is for overall survival, again, seeing the same sort of thing where you were down to two people um, alive and at uh, four years. Okay, now this is looking at DTIC versus the Dartmouth regimen, which is a whole concoction that I don't even remember because I haven't written for it in forever. Um, again, showing that even when you throw interferon and other chemotherapies into the mix, um, you don't get any benefit over DTIC. So uh, interferon, chemotherapies, none of these really, really work. Um, the one thing that did work sometimes was high dose IL-2, where this is a true tail on this curve, where people out 20, they had a long-term cure rate of around 10% at 20 years um, with high dose IL-2. Uh, back when I was a resident, we actually used to give high dose IL-2. Um, there's a whole unit in the hospital where that is all that they did. You ex there was standardized protocols. You expected people to be admitted to the hospital for a couple of weeks. They all ended up on dopamine. A lot of them ended up in the ICU. It was an incredibly rough regimen. But again, what it had that was different than um, DTIC, Abraxane, or interferon is that there was this small chance of keeping someone alive for 20 something years. And so this, I mean, you would do this, especially in a young, healthy person who could tolerate it, because you're looking for that 10% chance. Though that 10% chance is obviously really, really low, but it did give a whiff or a hint that immunotherapy could be extraordinarily useful and powerful in the setting of metastatic melanoma. And then came from really IL-2, which was, you, I, at least I think of it as just as a cytokine stimulator. Um, so basically you're just throwing the IL-2 and trying to yoke the immune system to attack and be aggressive in a very nonspecific way um, to really switching over using checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and I'll talk about checkpoint inhibitors before I talk about BRAF and CKIT mutations, but really checkpoint inhibitors really change the complete way that we even think about melanoma. The two big classes of checkpoint inhibitors that are currently approved are anti-CTLA-4 monoclonal antibodies and the PD-1 and PD-L1 monoclonal antibodies. And in this cartoon, you, it gives a very simplified version of how these interact, but essentially what they do um, is the anti-CTLA-4 antibodies knock the breaks off of T cells specifically and has, gives them a more um, activated phenotype. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Was there a question? No, you can continue. Okay. Um, 
the anti-CTLA-4 monoclonal antibodies basically kick the brakes off of T cells as they interact with antigen presenting cells and um, makes them in a much more activated phenotype where they are much less discriminant in what they attack. That allows them to be able to see neoantigens and attack the uh, mel uh, melanoma cells more effectively. The anti-CT, I'm sorry, the uh, PDL1 and PD1 monoclonal bodies, in contrast, uh, go to basically remove the shield on tumor cells. Tumor cells uh, will coat themselves with PDL1, which basically tells T cells that they are self. Um, and by using the PDL1 monoclonal antibodies, you essentially remove that shield or that cloak that the tumor cells are using where the T cells think that they are self. So instead now they realize that they are not self and they can attack them. So they're both ways to, one interacts with the uh, APCs, one with the tumor cells, but both of them are T cell activating agents. Okay. And this is looking at uh, the first hint of showing that doing better, this is looking at ipilimumab, which is the only uh, approved CTLA-4 monoclonal antibody in the U.S. at this time, uh, versus a essentially worthless vaccine called GP100. Um, so you can essentially think of it as a placebo-controlled trial, even though it wasn't quote-unquote placebo-controlled, the GP100 vaccine literally did absolutely nothing. So it was placebo. So, but when you look at using ipilimumab, and this is using four doses of ipilimumab um, followed by maintenance, you can see that there is a clear tail on the curve. Um, and this is again, people with metastatic melanoma, where you're now taking people four years out and having 20% of people alive who've received ipilimumab. And ipilimumab is an outpatient drug. It is not I, high dose IL-2. Uh, the death rate reported with uh, ipilimumab is 1%, and that's very consistent. Right around 40% of people who you give IPI to will have very few, if any, side effects. The other 59% will have any weird, crazy thing happen to them. If you name it, I think I have seen it um, with IPI. I have seen myasthenia gravis. I have seen every endocrinopathy you can think of. I have an endocrinologist actually on speed dial who I just text multiple times a day because I use immunotherapy uh, on a daily basis. Um, but really, if you think of something that can go wrong with the, uh, with the endocrine system, you can make that, you can give that gift to a patient of that endocrinopathy. Um, but uh, you do with that, you, you can reverse almost all of those. I guess the only death I've ever seen from IPI is really from uh, if, uh, from myasthenia gravis. But nevertheless, um, you give people this chance of having a cure rate of around 20%, which is actually very, very impressive for an outpatient drug. And it gives hope, realistic hope progression-free survival. And one thing to know about the immunotherapies is their response rates are still very low. So the progression-free survival curves look like someone jumped off a cliff where it just falls straight down because you're only benefiting with ipilimumab that 20% of people, you're not benefiting the most. So 80% of people's disease will just progress straight through it as if you did nothing. This is looking at the forest plot. Uh, show that there is really nothing that predicts there, and there still is, this, this study is 12 years old, but still to date, there is nothing that predicts who's going to respond to ipilimumab or not. Uh, just like there's really nothing that ex explains who's going to respond to high dose IL-2. Initially, there was ideas that was lung only meds are going to respond better, blah, 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 but there's really nothing that you can say, I will or will not give ipi 2 just like there was nothing that you could say, I will or will not give high dose IL-2 to because almost everyone has a chance of responding. Um, this is again, looking at treatment, uh, looking at uh, total number of deaths and 
uh, response rates. Again, response rates are very, very low, uh, but when people respond, there is that chance of that long-term survival. Again, response rates are only around 10%, which is harkens right back to the days of DTIC and Abraxane, but with IPI, unlike those, there's the chance for long-term survival. Um, this is then looking, hey, why don't we give ipilimumab plus the completely worthless drug uh, to carbazine and see if that does any better? And uh, no, it doesn't. There's no real significant difference in progression for your overall survival from the addition of DTIC to ipilimumab. So there really is no reason to give it. Though there's some separation in the curves, it is not statistically significant. So ipilimumab alone, it is. Um, again, response duration of response uh, for ipilimumab is significantly longer than it is with decarbazine. Uh, again, Ipilimumab plus decarbazine. Decarbazine adds very, very little to that combination. Don't do it. Um, but you can see where ipilimumab is getting your survivals of around 20% at three years. So what was the next step uh, after IPI? So again, with IPI, you have a response rate of around 10%, which is almost identical to what you have with chemotherapy, but instead you have the chance for long-term survival. It is a relatively toxic drug. And then just to be a complete downer, the cost of ipilimumab for the course for melanoma in the US is 360,000 US dollars. Uh, so that it's, while it's covered by insurance, it is expensive as all, get out. So then the next question comes, can we do better than that? So nivolumab is an anti-PD, uh, one monoclonal antibody, as I've already laid out, where that interacts between the T cells and the tumor cells versus ipilimumab, which interacts between the antigen presenting cells, the APCs and the T cells. Uh, nivolumab is very, very easy to give. Again, I gave you all the schedules up at the front of the presentation, but nivol uh, I use nivolumab on a daily basis, literally probably two to three times a day for the across various malignancies. The death rate again with nivolumab is less than 1%. We typically quote people that their only side effect they will have from it for about 80% of people is fatigue. And then the other 20% of people will have some kind of endocrinopathy. So it is, or colitis or hepatitis, it is dramatically less toxic than ipilimumab. Um, you can give nivolumab to almost anyone. One interesting cute thing about nivolumab too is the side effects of it are very tumor specific. So when you give nivolumab to someone with melanoma, they get vitiligo versus you never see that when you give it for lung cancer. When you give it to people with lung cancer, you see much higher rates of uh, thyroiditis, actually. Um, and if we all remember back, non-small cell lung cancer is TTF1 positive, so who knows. When you give it to someone who has a thymoma, uh, they get um, myocarditis, so, or they have a high, much higher risk of myocarditis. So there's disease-specific toxicities from these drugs, and, and really the disease-specific toxicity in melanoma, which is what we're talking about uh, for me this very early morning for you this Friday afternoon uh, is vitiligo. So looking at using uh, nivolumab, nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus ipilimumab alone in first line treatment for metastatic melanoma. This is uh, looking at the waterfall plots for this. So just taking a moment to look at these. So with the waterfall plots on the blue on the, uh, every bar on the, a waterfall plot represents a patient. So each one of these lines is an individual patient. The uh, zero mark is uh, the point of inflection where anything above it is the cancer growing. So all of these people's cancers grew. Um, everything below it is cancers shrinking. Every black arrow on here is someone who is still responding to therapy. Okay, so if that makes sense. So you can see the vast majority of people are still responding. So looking at these individuals, so here's the graph for ipilimumab, where you can see around that, what, 20%, 10, 20% response rate, because those are the number of people who actually have a 30% or more shrinkage in their tumor, which is how you define response rates by resist criteria. Um, 
So the minority of people are responding, but people are responding again with all the black arrows because it's kind of a combined waterfall swimmers plot um, are still responding. Versus when you look at ipilimumab, I mean, so when you look at nivolumab, a dramatic amount more people are responding. And when you look at the combination, it's even higher where both with nivolumab and nivolumab plus ipi uh, or nevo ipi, the majority of people are actually responding to disease as opposed to the majority of people not responding to disease. So this is clearly a huge change. And you can also see this, the portion, proportion of people who have complete responses to therapy has significantly increased by the use of nivolumab or the combination of ipinevo. So this is looking at the details of the study. Back then, we actually used to look at pdl one expression, which we really don't anymore because it doesn't really predict anything um, in BRAF status. I will talk about the BRAF inhibitors in a little bit, but again, immunotherapy is really, to me, what has moved the cheese, so to say. So this was the randomized study looking again at the doses and schedules. Um, and I already showed you the waterfall plot. This is now looking at the um, intention to treat and the uh, and progression free survival in the different populations shown that nivolumab or nevo plus ipi have dramatically uh, improved results where you're ending up with the majority of people progression free at a year, which is a huge change. Because remember with chemotherapy, you were looking at a total survival of, um, total survival of 10 to 12 months versus with ipi nevo, you're looking at a progression free survival with a degree of the uh, curves plateauing of that. So this is a huge change. Um, again, pdl one status does not influence responses in this disease, so we do not even check it anymore. This study was a little bit older, so they were still checking it back in those days. So looking at response rates, remember with our chemotherapy, our response rates was what? Uh, 11 to 15%, 15% with Abraxane, 11% with Docarbazine. So now we're looking at response rates here. Um, that are much, much higher. So our complete response rates with ipi nevo or nevo are almost equating the response rates that and the partial responses that you could get with chemotherapy, um, which again should be dramatically impressive. And also looking the uh, majority of people have stable or improved disease. And in fact, with ipi nevo, actually the majority of people have tumor shrinkage. which is really, really nice, uh, um, obviously. So objective response rates of nearly 60% with a combination. Another thing to note, and I'll go through a study on this in a minute, but these drugs also cross the blood-brain barrier. Like I gave you my example with my patient, Randy, um, these drugs can actually get rid of brain mets as well uh, without having to do radiation or surgery. Uh, breaking it down, um, that objective response rate based on PDL1 uh, status does not really change significantly. A PDL1 positive versus PDL1 negative, while the response rates go down in PDL1 negative, they are still dramatically higher than they are with chemotherapy. So it's really not a useful test because with nivolumab alone in a PDL1 negative tumor, you're still getting a 40% response rate, which is fourfold higher than you would get with chemotherapy. So there's not another real option. So there's no reason to test it because you're not really excluding anyone from immunotherapy by them being PDL1 negative. Uh, so looking at five-year survival uh, for the combination of ipi nevo, um, you're again looking out to the green is the combination. Um, and the blue is Nevo alone, the black is Ipi alone, but you're looking out at five years where you're having right around um, a third of people still in remission. And again, you can clearly see that the curves are plateaued in half of people with metastatic melanoma alive at five years with these drugs. The other thing to know about them too is when you look at the schedules, you only treat them for two years. So at 24 months right here, you are no longer treating these patients. These people are all just on observation. 
that 20, again, 24 months. So the, after this line right here, these are all, all unmaintained remissions. These are people who are on no active drug. They are just staying in remission from previous stage four disease for, in this study, three years post treatment with no, uh, also when you get to this point, they're having no ongoing toxicity since you're not treating them. They are essentially normal and they are in remission, which is, which is to me incredibly impressive and completely different than anything you would ever see with chemotherapy alone. Uh, BRAF mutations do not uh, influence outcomes in uh, people treated with immunotherapy. As you can see uh, in this curve, there's essentially no real difference. So really BRAF mutations and um, PDL1 status don't help you choose who you can give immunotherapy to. Um, and this is just showing that by progression free and the other slide was overall survival showing it does not really change it. Uh, this is just graphically showing um, about how people uh, who um, are off the therapy for years. And then this is, um, a, I love this uh, plot. Um, so patients alive at five years. So of people who were treated with the two years of nivolumab and ipilimumab, 74% um, of people at five years are on no ongoing therapy. Otherwise people are on clinical trials or some other type of therapy. But again, the majority of people treated with either nivolumab or nivolumab plus ipi at five years are on no therapy. Um, yeah, to me, so that brings up the idea of, are you functionally curing these people who previously had widespread disease uh, with two years of immunotherapy um, with no ongoing therapy? It's kind of a stunning graph to look at and to digest because these are people who in the era before immunotherapy and what I had shown you with the beginning of the presentation with the DTIC and with the Abraxane, these are all people who are dead at 10 to 12 months. So instead, 74% of the people treated with ipinevo at five years have not been on any therapy for three years and are their lives are returned to them without ongoing toxicities. This is now showing that these drugs cross the blood brain barrier. So this is looking at ipinevo in uh, patients with melanoma metastatic to the brain. Um, again, 91% of them had had no prior brain directed therapy. They were just treated with ipinevo. Um, and you can see the number of lesions. Half of them had one lesion, apparently treated somebody who had, didn't have a lesion. Um, anyway, the response rates um, were comparable uh, with the brain lesions versus the uh, non-brain lesions. Again, you're having response rates of over 50%, which is incredibly impressive in the brain. That also then gets rid of the toxicities of whole brain radiation, stereotactic radiation, and the obvious toxicities of a craniotomy. Um, and then showing that this is time and duration of the response, looking at that at the first time point. So the uh, circle showed the first time someone responded. Again, showing you can get responses laid out, but the majority of people responded at the first MRI, which was at eight weeks. So, and then this is again, a swimmer's plot showing that the majority of people continue to respond for a year or more intracranially without again, any intracranially directed therapy. So while my patient Randy really wanted to go get his brain whacked on, um, when they, because he made his own opinion with uh, appointment with a neurosurgeon, um, I didn't refer him. Uh, even though uh, he went and had that, remember there was nothing there when they went in except for an empty tumor cavity. Again, you know, it's an anecdote of a patient that I've treated, but this is clear data showing that you can get away with it. There is really no difference in. Uh, progression-free and overall, I mean, sorry, intracranial and extracranial uh, progression-free. So basically if they respond in the brain, they will respond everywhere 
else. And this, this is looking at overall survival. One thing that you'll see through these studies is that we are getting better and better at using these drugs. Um, and our overall survival slowly creeps up from the studies in 2012, where the combinations really started, to today. So this is looking at Ipinevo in a more modern study, anywhere you're having an 81, and this is all people with brain mats, keep in mind, and you're looking at an 82% overall survival. Again, hating to pick on chemotherapy, but an 82% overall survival with ipinevo for people with brain metastases versus an overall survival of only um, 10 to 12 months with chemotherapy. It's, it's not even the same disease essentially anymore. We kick its butt. Okay, now looking at the next, um, the ne next drug out there. One thing to keep in mind, Ipinevo, people always hear that they are st uh, studied together and combined. The reason is because they're made by the same drug company. So that's the reason why Ipinevo are always together. That's why it's never Pembro Ipi. There is no biological difference whatsoever. Um, it is uh, between, Ipi ne uh, between Nevo and Pembro, they are completely interchangeable. It's just what drug company owns the drug. So what drug company actually studied the drug and actually produced the data that led to the FDA approvals. So Pembro is owned by the competitor. Um, while I said there was no difference in the PDL one as far as discriminating against chemotherapy for who you can and cannot use, um, you, you could see that there was some small difference between uh, with higher percent responses in PDL1 positive disease versus negative. But again, remember you were looking at PDL1 negative was around 40% with Nevo um, versus 60% if they're PDL1 positive. Uh, but those numbers are so much higher than chemotherapy that they're not used at the discrimination point. But if you're going to be a competitive drug company, right, uh, which is the one that owns Pembro, for example, they're going to stack their study against the other company's drug to make it look better. So when you, if you remember when you're looking at the nivolumab versus Ipi paper, the PD-L1 positive was 26%. In contrast, when now you have a competitor who's trying to dethrone the other drug company's um, drug, they, the way that they designed their study, they had an 80% PD-L1 positive versus IPI. So they're trying to, there is a selection bias with this in this study where they're attempting to make themselves look better than Nevo, even though they're not. So it's just looking at the details of the study, because it, it's right here with this PD-L1 positive, they're somewhat playing games with the way that they designed the study. It's just cute to note those uh, little things. So looking at it, so Pem this is again, the waterfall plot, again, Pembro, kicked Ippy's butt, um, which is the same thing that Nevo did with the vast majority of people responding. But again, you'll notice there is that creep with Ippy where people are responding more and more. Again, this is an enriched population for pd one though. Um, and then this is looking at progression-free survival um, and overall survival where uh, Pembro can uh, beat Ippy just like Nevo beat Ippy. Again, the numbers look better than they looked with uh, Nevo, but there was a selection bias based on PDL1 positive tumors. And you also see that over time, the overall survival for uh, melanoma continues to improve. Because the other thing, too, for overall survival, to keep in mind, all of these people who got Ippy and failed it then went right on to get Nevo. Uh, so that's another reason why you see the change in the curves over time. Um, and again, we're getting much, much better at delivering the drugs and handling their toxicities. Uh, looking at uh, toxicities, um, if you look at people who had uh, grade three, four, five toxicity, it was right around one third uh, of people in each arm. And keep in mind, one thing that they, uh, when they looked at the original study for docetaxel versus nivolumab um, and second line therapy for non small cell lung cancer. When you actually look at grade three or higher toxicity with uh, chemotherapy, it's 80%. Um, so, 
I, that number always has stuck with me. So 80% of people you give chemo to are gonna have something bad happen to them. We're looking at a third of people with immunotherapy. Um, this is a great tool that I would encourage you when you're using immunotherapy to go to. I've listed the website here. You can just go to it and it will tell you what to do. Um, what you just It's literally just a uh, radio button uh, website where you just go through and click what your toxicity is and it will tell you how to manage said toxicity. Uh, basically the answer is a lot of steroids um, and sometimes infliximab, uh, mycophenolate um, and other drugs that we'll use, plasmapheresis sometimes, but nevertheless, this is a great little tool for as you're getting familiar with and using immunotherapy, helping you manage it. Okay, so that is talking about immunotherapy and metastatic melanoma. And that's essentially where we are at today with it. We are still using Ipi Nevo um, or in select patients, just Nevo or Pembro. Um, we are not using chemotherapy in anyone except after they fail, failed all immunotherapy if we cannot convince them to go on to hospice. Uh, so what is the other major way that we can attack melanoma, right? So remember about 40 to 50% of people who have cutaneous melanoma as opposed to mucosal melanoma or uh, ocular melanoma will have a BRAF mutation. Um, and of course we can attack that. Um, again, remember BRAF mutations do not necessarily predict response to immunotherapy. So it's kind of dealer's choice or it is dealer's choice whether you go after um, metastatic melanoma with immunotherapy or if you go after it with a BRAF mutation, if you find one, I personally use immunotherapy first in almost everyone um, because of the chance of getting them off drug. Because with immunotherapy, you're looking at the people you can get to remission, uh, two years of therapy, then you're done, as opposed to the BRAF inhibitors, if they respond, and then you will have some people with remarkably long responses to BRAF inhibitors, they will be on BRAF inhibitors and accumulating side effects the entire time that they are on it, i.e. the rest of their life. So this is looking at vemurafenib, which is the first generation BRAF inhibitor um, versus uh, decarbazine. So again, you're kind of, to use a uh, an American colloquialism, you're kind of kicking the puppy here, right? We all know that decarbazine sucks. So, but this is now using vemurafenib versus it. And this is again, a large randomized study of people with metastatic melanoma around the world. Here is the uh, waterfall plot. Um, you can again see decarbazine uh, has a very low response rate. But when you're looking at vemurafenib, it, the response rate is actually even higher than it is with uh, immunotherapy, where you're seeing a good 80% of people with some type of disease shrinkage versus decarbazine, where you're seeing 10, 20% of people with disease shrinkage. And progression-free survival is also dramatically better with vemurafenib versus decarbazine. And on the forest plot, you cannot find anything that would predict that someone would respond better to chemo than to vemurafenib. Again, assuming they harbor the uh, BRAF mutation. But again, one thing looking with progression-free survival as we are out at months with vemurafenib alone, you're not getting a tail on the curve. Everyone is mutating and progressing. And that curve is actually very, very reminiscent of non-small cell lung cancer. If you remember back to when I talked about non-small cell lung cancer, if you were at that presentation, um, where the first generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which venumorafenib is the first generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor in this disease, much like erlotinib was in non-small cell lung cancer for people with EGFR mutations, um, they all fail around 10 months or by around 10 months. Um, but still, this is nevertheless significantly better than uh, chemotherapy and again, overall survival. But one thing to immediately keep in mind, this is months, not years with these drugs. And remember with immunotherapy, we were looking at years or our, our, the scale was very, very different. We were looking at people 48 months out, not 10 months out. Um, so the question is, can we do better than that? Um, this is looking at a randomized study of a 
MEK inhibitor plus a BRAF inhibitor um, with really the uh, idea of attacking the disease at two points along the MAP kinase pathway because the way that the tumors escape from single agent BRAF inhibition is through amplification further down the road through MEK. So now by hitting MEK with BINI, um, can you do better? So this is looking at the combination um, uh, versus either VEMI or uh, ENCO, uh, looking at the differences between them in a large randomized phase three study. So first generation BRAF inhibitor, second generation BRAF inhibitor, BRAF inhibitor plus MEK inhibitor. There is no difference based on mutational status. If they have a BRAF mutation, they have a BRAF mutation, as long as it's a V600. Does it not matter if it's E1, E2, or K? Also remember, um, I don't know how you guys test for BRAF, but when these drugs were first approved, they were approved with what's called a COBOS test that was uh, the RFDA approved with it. Those actually would miss uh, V600E2 mutations and uh, K mutations. So it's really next generation sequencing as a way to find these. Anyway, um, looking at these, uh, uh, the big punch line here is looking at um, long-term outcomes with a combination. 20% of people long-term are on combination therapy versus 10% with the first generation and 5% with the second generation. Um, and again, response rates are higher with the combination where you're getting a complete response rate on central review of around 12% uh, with the combination MEK plus BRAF inhibitors. Remember, so just for contrast, 12% uh, complete response rate is the response rate that you would get with chemotherapy would, for a partial response rate. And again, the vast majority of these people are responding 60 to depending on who's looking at the scan, 60 to 70% of people are responding. And then disease control rate, which is basically stable disease plus response, 90% of people are having disease control versus 10% with chemotherapy. Um, this is looking at now the long-term outcomes. This is now out at three years with a combination. A third of people are still on therapy and a third of people are in uh, some degree of remission. But again, contrasting to immunotherapy, this is another year of buying pills, another year of being on pills. And these pills typically cost around eight to $10,000 a month. And I agree with whatever that baby just said. Um, this is then looking at overall survival again looking out the combination of the two drugs is better than either drug by itself. And there is again, nobody um, uh, who benefits from the older drugs, the newer drugs work. And the other better, and the other thing to keep in mind is the newer drugs actually cross the blood brain barrier as well. Um, so just like immunotherapy, uh, ENCO and BINI will cross the blood brain barrier and you do not need to treat the intracranial disease different than the extracranial disease. Um, this is looking at side effects. These drugs are actually kind of annoying to give if you've given them. Um, the rashes are not insignificant. The fevers are not insignificant. The, they can cause secondary skin cancers as well. Um, and whenever I've had them cause secondary skin cancers, always in the worst place. There's always, always on the tip of the nose or something else like that. So there is long-term ongoing side effects with these drugs. Again, why I typically would choose immunotherapy over um, BRAF therapy as my first line is because even grade one, grade two side effects, if they last for the rest of your life are incredibly annoying. No one wants grade one diarrhea for the rest of their life, um, which is essentially what you get with BRAF inhibitors um, because they are not fixed duration, they are indefinite therapy. Um, Again, looking at this is looking at our five-year overall survival then um, using the combination of therapy, you're getting it right around a third, which is right around the same thing that you would see with immunotherapy. So there's not a big difference other than the annoyance and the cost of being on therapy indefinitely. Um, 
uh, this is comparing the three different regimens that are currently available. I actually used Dabrafenib and Tremi more than I used the other ones, but really showing there's not that big of a difference between any of them. But any of these three options um, are appropriate for treating uh, metastatic BRAF mutated melanoma. And again, a lot of this is just for reference for dosing. Um, there's a different side effect profile between these drugs where uh, you get more fevers with, when you're using dabrafenib and you get more skin cancers when you're using bemurafenib, just to be aware of. And again, the pooled analysis out at five years, um, you are keeping people a lot progression-free and alive. This is now looking at the last study that we're going to look at for metastatic melanoma. And I'll actually probably stop with metastatic melanoma. I have slides on uh, adjuvant therapy. I could give, I have probably 30 slides on adjuvant therapy, um, but I've been talking for almost an hour and we'll have gone through over 60 slides. So we'll stop after this. Uh, but this is looking, I can give those at a later date or I can just provide the slides to Alice here. Um, this is now looking at what if you just give people everything? What if you give them a tezeluzumab, vemurafenib, and uh, combi? So basically, you're going to give them immunotherapy and you're going to give them BRAF therapy at the same time versus just BRAF therapy. So you're giving them the entire kitchen sink. So looking at this, when you add a tezeluzumab, which is again just a PDA1 inhibitor, um, there is some in, uh, improvement. And this was actually then FDA approved. You are getting a longer duration of response. The overall response really isn't changing. There is a modest increase in toxicity, but no real change in overall survival. So this is an option. It is not a necessarily a good option, but you could potentially throw this at somebody by giving them everything up front. Um, Progression-free survival is extended, uh, but there's really no change in overall survival as it has been reported to date. Um, so I'd actually, even while, even though that's FDA approved, I don't know, I've never actually heard of anyone actually giving it. There's not that 4% difference in response rate is not really worth it. Um, because it is more toxic and the four month change in progression for your survival, you don't know that you cannot get that just by treating people with the drugs serially rather than all at once. And also the one other thing is the metric in oncology, at least in the US, for what's regardless of what the p-value is, what's considered a clinically meaningful hazard ratio is less than 0.8. And this does not pass that bar. Um, that's the bar that was established with the advent of bevacizumab as what would be considered clinically useful impact it was 0.8. Um, just also keep in mind, there are a small number of people who will have KIT mutations. So people who don't have BRAF mutations, you still need to look for KIT mutations. And then this is just a quick summary slide looking at um, how you can treat these people with either a matinib or nilotinib or satinib, blah, blah, blah. Here are all of your references. Your response rates are superior to chemotherapy. Your progression-free survivals though are still relatively short. Your overall survival is still relatively short, but this is something you could target and use rather than treating them with chemotherapy. So in summary, as we sit here in 2022, um, five-year overall response rates are greater than 40% with single agent PD-1 and with combination therapy, they're over 50%. Um, it's really dealer's choice whether you give single or double agents. There are a whole bunch of clinical trials going on right now um, trying to improve on this, but nothing has really improved on it being Nevo or Nevo. Um, the targeted therapies are highly effective. We have three different regimens and I've shown you that data as well and all of the references. And there is this question about whether or not you give people immunotherapy plus target therapy up front. But again, the utility of that is very unclear. Um, you have that modest change in progression free survival, but you don't know that you could not obtain that just by giving the drugs serially rather than all at once. And those are my 65 slides on metastatic melanoma. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, again, I'll coordinate, I'll take any questions anyone has, and I will coordinate with Alice here whether we talk about adjuvant therapy or if I just provide the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for 
interesting presentation and I hope we can hear you uh, again. So, у кого-нибудь есть есть вопросы, вы можете задать нашему спикеру. If someone have question, you can ask our speaker. У кого-нибудь есть вопросы? Вообще, в последние десятилетия изменилось, uh, изменилось взгляд на лечение меланомы. Долгое время меланома оставалась неизлечим заболеванием с низким результатом лечения. Но с открытием иммунотерапии и открытием генной терапии результаты лечения меланомы значительно улучшились. Вот. Поэтому сегодня была представлена очень интересная презентация, посвященная метастатическому раку метастатической меланоме. Надеюсь, в следующий раз профессор найдет время для того, чтобы прочитать лекцию по одевантной терапии меланомы. Если ни у кого нет вопросов, то мы завершим сегодняшнюю uh, презентацию. So I think nobody have a questions, but your presentation was very interesting, and I hope that you can find time to uh, present the adjuvant therapy of melanoma, maybe in some future. Yes, I don't so know. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. And see you next time. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.